Ivan Werning. Um, it's called The Political Economy of Nonlinear Capital Taxation. Um, and it's related to, she's trying to connect it to what the uh, other speakers talked about. Uh, Ilya, in one of his talks, uh, emphasized that everything that was being done uh, in this conference uh, was done under the assumption of a full commitment. And sometimes it's a fine assumption, but it's also interesting to try to understand uh, what, uh, what happens when we deviate a bit from this assumption uh, and how the results are, are, are altered uh, in this case. But more to the point of this paper, what, what really motivated us is that in most countries, um, you observe positive capital taxes. Okay. And not only positive, but uh, there are a lot of features uh, of the tax code uh, that made capital taxes progressive. By progressive, uh, I'm going to be, so this is supposed to be a marginal tax rate. So increasing marginal tax rates uh, uh, is the idea. So let me try to, uh, so capital is taxed in many different places in the tax code. That makes it a bit difficult uh, to come up with a, a schedule for capital taxation that would be comparable to a schedule for labor income taxation. Uh, but let me try to uh, cite a few places in the tax code that contribute to positive capital taxes, and, uh, and then a few places in the tax code that contribute to progressive capital taxes. So I'm going to talk about uh, economies that uh, advanced economies. Uh, some of them uh, in the U.S. Uh, you'll see that some of these features are are more relevant to to Europe. Uh, and I know much less about the tax code in Israel. So uh, typically, uh, you see corporate income taxes. Okay, that's a tax on capital. Oftentimes, the, the, there's a special treatment for capital gains, and that's a, a topic that's, that's very controversial, actually. Income taxes in most countries uh, tax not only labor income, but also capital income. It's a tax on total income. Okay? So it contributes uh, to capital taxation. Uh, most countries also have estate taxes. Uh, and uh, some countries, like France, for example, have wealth taxes. So you pay uh, uh, a percentage uh, on uh, your total wealth, and typically it's like there's an exemption and then a few brackets, and the rates are, are pretty low. Uh, features that contribute to the progressivity of capital taxes, well, think about it. In most countries, the income tax is also progressive. Okay, so to the extent that income is meant to uh, uh, include both labor and capital income, that means that capital taxes are also going to be progressive. The estate tax, when there is one, is typically progressive also. And the typical feature would again be an exemption and then a flat rate or a couple brackets uh, that, would be, uh, that would be progressive. And the wealth tax, as I described it, uh, also, have, uh, progr also has progressive features. Okay? I'm sorry? That's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, but to the extent that you can accumulate wealth from one period to the next, this is going to be a tax. It's, it's going to have also a feature that's going to be capital taxation. The other feature is the, uh, the wealth levy. That's going to be, okay? And I'm going to be talking a lot about that. All right, so that's, uh, I wish I could be a bit more precise and a bit more quantitative, but trust me that it's a bit hard to come up uh, with uh, good estimates uh, there. So for labor income taxes, it's pretty easy. Uh, I, uh, labor income is also taxed in many different places, but it's pretty easy to put all those pieces together. I mean, it's easier to put all those pieces together than for, than for capital income. And part of the reason also is that uh, capital is, uh, is something that's actually quite heterogeneous. So there's housing, there's human capital, there are all these things, and they're all taxed a bit differently. So it's just to be hard to come up with, with, uh, with one number. And I'm not going to dig too much into this heterogeneity, even though I think it's important, but try to think a bit more abstractly about this issue of uh, progressivity uh, and capital accumulation. So let's contrast uh, these style aspects with the normative theories uh, that we have about capital taxes. 
And these normative theories are uh, mixed. You have some very strong benchmarks in the literature that prescribe zero capital taxes, and they came up uh, uh, many times uh, during this summer school. You have the Atkinson Stiglitz result that tells you that under some conditions uh, about preferences, uh, namely separability between consumption and leisure, uh, it's not a good idea to use capital taxes for redistribution. And you're better off trying to do that through a labor income tax or consumption tax, or uniform consumption taxes. You also have another branch of the literature that's a bit different. Uh, it's not really concerned with inequality. It's concerned with financing a given stream of expenditure. Uh, and typically, it assumes that lump sum taxes are unavailable. And so the only thing you, can, you have as a government uh, to finance your budget is uh, distortionary labor taxes and distortionary capital taxes, for example. And in those theories, typically the prediction is that you should see very high capital taxes in the very beginning uh, because the initial capital stock is inelastic uh, to capital taxes. So taxing capital is like a lump sum tax. But then uh, they should go down pretty quickly, and in steady state, they should be equal to zero. If you're willing to strengthen uh, the assumptions a little bit and consider preferences that are CRRA, for example, uh, so preferences that we like to work with, then you get that capital taxes are zero after a two period. So, uh, so this is kind of telling you also that to raise revenues, it's kind of a bad idea eventually uh, to use capital taxes. Okay. And you have some theories. Uh, that uh, predict non-zero capital taxes. So you can uh, build on Atkinson Stiglitz and try to take seriously the non-separabilities uh, between consumption and leisure. Uh, and you can get some traction from there. I don't know that anybody has really tried to rationalize progressive capital taxes from those issues and had, has taken them so seriously to, uh, to try to uh, explain uh, these features of the tax code. But I, I don't say that it couldn't be done. And then uh, you've heard a little bit about another possible theory of capital taxation, which is the inverse Euler equation. Okay. But in any case, um, so, so the inverse Euler equation, actually, there's a presumption that the capital ca tax is going to be regressive and not progressive. Uh, but I, I don't want to go into that. So, so maybe it could talk, speak about this fact, but it would be silent uh, on this. You had a question? For sure, but you don't get progressivity out of that. And, and just to, you know, the reason they use this functional form is not because it's a, they think it's a great functional form uh, to describe the world. It's because it's a functional form that has great computational advantages because it allows them to kill one state variable. Okay. Yeah. So I know that paper. Uh, some of the features of that paper are going to be quite related uh, to what we have here and to another paper that I have, which is called Progressive Estate Taxation. Uh, and some of the features are, are a bit different. It's a paper that has a very particular uh, welfare function and that also has incomplete taxation. And uh, so those two features are key for their results. Another one that's key is that they have two forms of shocks. They have productivity shocks, which I'm going to have also here. And then they have shocks uh, to uh, how much you want to bequest to your children. So some people just like their, old, like their children more uh, than others. If they had only the first shocks, they would get subsidies. So it's only with the second shocks that they can get uh, some capital taxes. Uh, all right? OK, so we're left a bit with, uh, at this stage, a bit of a puzzle. We can't seem to rationalize uh, what we see in the world, we're, uh, with, at least with the existing normative theories. So what explains equilibrium capital taxation? So of course, it's a very old question, and, and we're certainly not the first one uh, to ask it. And so there are a lot of positive theories about capital taxation. And typically, and I'm going to review them, typically those theories speak to the level of capital taxes, but are completely silent on the progressivity. So I'm going to give you, there, there's basically, you can organize this literature 
probably a bit unfairly to, to uh, the, the richness of, of the different contributions in, uh, in two bins. So the first one has to do with timing consistency, uh, as first uh, described by Killen and Prescott. And the application to capital taxation is really was made by Stan Fisher, actually, in a paper uh, in 1980. So the idea is, uh, it's in the, this Ramsey tradition, uh, the Ramsey tradition that uh, the chamley judd result is attached to. So you have a representative agent. The government needs to finance some expenditure. You only have linear taxes. Lump sum taxes are uh, ruled out by assumption. And imagine a two-period model, an ex-post, capital is sunk, uh, it's inelastic, so taxing capital looks like a lump sum tax exposed, so it's very attractive. So if you don't have commitment, uh, you're likely to observe capital taxation. Of course, agents will understand that and uh, maybe not save all that much. Uh, you can see how it would work. So that's one strain of the literature. Another strain has to do with the redistribution. So the typical model uh, would work a bit like this. You would have commitment, so forget about timing consistency. But you have some heterogeneity across agents. Okay. And uh, imagine that the only instrument that you have is a linear tax on capital. Okay. And the proceeds are not used to finance government expenditures, but uh, are rebated lump sum to the agents. Okay. Then uh, if you have a political theory, like if you have the, you know, uh, a way to aggregate preferences where uh, the equilibrium capital tax is decided by the median voter, uh, and if you have a skewed distribution of income, then the median voter will go for uh, capital taxation uh, because he's poorer than the mean, and so he will get some resources. You can rationalize uh, capital taxation from that. But you can see also that it's not really, uh, so first, in all those theories, the instruments are in, uh, imposed by assumption and, and, and not derived. And second, the way they are imposed, uh, they don't try to speak about, uh, about progressivity. They could, uh, presumably, uh, but they don't. Okay. So what we're going to do is try to, uh, try to do that. Okay, and propose a political th economy theory of, of capital taxation that speaks to both the level and the progressivity of capital taxes. And it's going to combine elements of those two literatures that I was describing before, redistribution and time inconsistency. Okay. So the ingredients, before I describe the full model, is going to be heterogeneous agents. There are going to be elections. So policies are going to be decided not uh, once and for all and set in stone, but rather in every period uh, through elections without commitment. And there's going to be a concern for redistribution that's going to be expressed uh, through these elections. Okay. We're not going to restrict uh, tax instruments a priori. We're going to try to derive the kind of tax instruments that uh, should arise in an economy like this one. They're going to be constrained only by uh, the constraints that we put on the environment, so informational constraints and credibility constraints, as we'll see what they are which I think is an attractive feature over uh, the literature, that I did, the positive literature that I described. So it's a bit more in the, in the Merlis tradition, if you want to think about it. Okay. And, and basically, the key thing is that ex post, you have a model where you have heterogeneous agents. You care about inequality. Uh, policy is decided through elections. So ex post, there's going to be a temptation to do extreme redistribution. To impose a capital levy, wipe the, slate wipe the slates clean, and start the world over. And we're going to need something to hold that back. Okay? Because a wealth levy is not something, I mean, it's certainly a positive tax on capital, but it's not progressive. It's 100% tax. Okay? And what uh, we're going to try to introduce to hold this back is some kind of uh, reputation. Okay? But at the level of a society, not the reputation of a particular player. I'm going to say exactly uh, what I mean by that. The idea is that. If you implement such a wealth levy, then you're going to trigger bad expectations about the future. Agents are going to start anticipating that this might happen again. Okay. Uh, and this is something that you take into account when uh, you elect a political platform. Okay. And the main results uh, that we're going to get out of this is that well, we're going to deliver on the, the progressivity of capital taxes. So you'll see that that emerges from the model. 
Uh, in terms of the levels, we're going to see positive capital taxes at the top in a way that I'll make precise, and negative capital taxes at the bottom. So uh, just talking about this, there are features uh, in the tax code that contribute to negative uh, taxes on capital. If you think about certain human capital accumulation, or if you think about housing and things like that. So there are certainly elements of the capital stock that are subsidized. Another feature, and I was talking about this with, with Eric in, in the cab today, uh, is the following. When you think about estate taxation, uh, typically estate tax rates are either zero or positive. A lot of people are actually clustered at zero, really almost zero bequest. But one thing that you cannot do is leave negative bequests. You cannot borrow against your children. Okay, so if you're at that constraint, okay, if you anticipate that your children might be have a have a brighter future than you, or you're in trouble on your children, it's impossible to borrow against them. Okay, so you're borrowing constraint, and that acts like a negative implicit tax on capital. It's another feature of the tax code that uh, resembles that. Of course, it's it's not as smooth as what we're going to get. But there would ways. There would be ways to to make it a bit less smooth by uh, moving away from the kind of utilitarian uh, objectives that are going to arise in the model and going more towards something a bit Rawlsian that places a lot of weight on the on the tax. And the mechanism is going to be really uh, straightforward. Uh, the idea is that by increasing uh, the progressivity of capital taxes, you're going to compress inequality in the future. Okay, richer people are going to face higher uh, taxes on capital than poorer people. So the inherited distribution of wealth is going to be more compressed than otherwise. So you're going to reduce future inequality. And because you reduce future inequality, you're going to improve the credibility of this policy in the sense that it's going to be less tempting to deviate, implement a wealth levy, and wipe the slate clean just because there is less inequality uh, in future periods. But it's going to be about working out uh, that basic insight. And I really want to emphasize that it's driven by extante consideration, not exposed considerations. Okay? You put in place progressive capital taxes uh, to prevent a bad outcome in the future. Okay? So uh, at some point when we were presenting this, it was still uh, the president in the US was different than the one that it is now. And there was this slogan which was called uh, like a compassionate conservative. So it's a bit of a, a way to be a smart, compassionate conservative. Okay? You try to make sure that there are some uh, minimal safety nets uh, to prevent social unrest uh, that might trigger uh, very drastic outcomes like revolutions and uh, wealth levies and, and things like that. Okay? And we're not just going to be about, uh, about mechanisms and implicit tax rates. Uh, we're also going to try to propose explicit uh, tax implementation. And you'll see that we'll be able to implement our allocations with uh, two simple taxes, uh, a nonlinear tax on income and a progressive tax on capital. So two separate schedules, okay. which, is, uh, which is nice because you might think, oh, it's going to be necessary to tax jointly income and capital and things like that. And, uh, it's not the case in any way. Uh, all right. So this is a bit uh, something to give you an idea of the literature. Uh, so there's a Ramsey kind of literature that talks about timing consistency, so starting with Kittle and Prescott and the important paper by, by Stein Fisher. And then people also try to incorporate these ideas of, of reputation uh, a bit later. Uh, and we have some uh, examples, uh, some examples here. And in particular, there's a concept that we're going to be using that was developed uh, in a paper in a GPE by Chari and Kehoe, which is the concept of sustainable plans. So as you'll see, we'll try to model this economy as a game. And it's going to be a game where you're going to have many players. You're going to have governments, actually competing governments in elections. And you're also going to have agents in the economy. And we really want to focus the strategic interactions on the governments and not so much on the agents uh, in the economy. And so we're going to, it's, it's a way of trying to blend a bit, to make the agents competitive and to make only uh, the governments uh, strategic. So there's an assumption about strategies that's going to give us that. Okay, but it's definitely a restriction that we're going to put 
Then there's uh, a literature on redistribution uh, that combines typically a median voter, a skewed distribution, and commitment. And uh, the classic papers in that literature are Person, Tabellini, Alessina, Roderick, and Berto. And we're also going to be building on this uh, new dynamic Merlis literature. And this, these are old slides. So these were uh, some of the papers that were around at the time. And the list has expanded a lot. So, so. so I'm going to try to convey uh, the basic intuition for the model uh, in a two-period model. And there I'm going to have to cut a corner a little bit um, because, as I told you, a key ingredient uh, that holds back the desire to implement a wealth levy is some kind of reputation or the triggering of bad expectation. And it's something that's a bit difficult to get in a two-period model, as you can understand. So we'll have a way of trying to proxy for that. But I think you'll get a lot of intuition from that model. And then I'll move to an infinite horizon model where I will not make that, I will not cut that corner, and I will uh, uh, model these expectations. Well, that's precisely our model. So the tax plan is going to be not just capital taxes. It's going to include like uh, the whole tax code, actually. So you're going to announce the tax code, OK? And you want this to, in the model, what's going to happen is you're going to want to prevent uh, people from proposing a different tax code in the future, OK? And, and so you're going to take into account the fact that they might be tempted to do that. And so you have to propose something that they will not want to renege upon. Uh, there's going to be a lot of benefits for them from reneging because incentives are sunk and capital has already been accumulated. But there's also going to be a cost, which is that if they do that, they're going to trigger bad expectations. Sure. You can commit yourself to anything. For sure. So in the two-period model, the cost is just going to be a parameter. And there it's going to be impossible for me to say exactly where that thing is and whether these constraints are binding or not. In the dynamic model, I can because I'm going to endogenize this cost. And, and then I'll be able to say uh, whether this constraint. Actually, you'll see. Uh, there's a very simple argument that will allow you to say that these constraints have to be uh, occasionally binding. And then I will be able to tell you what happens when those constraints are binding and how they affect uh, the, op the, not the optimal, but the equilibrium tax plan. Another way you could commit potentially is to put your tax code into the Constitution. In the same way that sure. some people would argue you could put a damage budget uh, amendment into the Constitution. I think you can definitely do things like that. And I'm very happy in my two-period model of interpreting these things as raising the cost of deviating. But a const constitutions are rewritten. Uh, revolutions happen. And, you know. They are rewritten, but they're much harder. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure. But I, the, the only question for us is whether you think that constitutions trivialize the commitment issues or not. Uh, and I, I think we have a lot of examples today <laughs> that they don't. I'm sorry? Oh, so, so in my model, I'm not going to put aggregate shocks. I could. And then it would have to, the optimal tax code would be contingent on, on this shock. Not inconceivable. Anyways, no aggregate shocks here, so uh, it will be easier. <laughs> All right, so here's my two period model. There's going to be a continuum of agents, okay? And uh, their preferences are, should be very familiar by now. These are the preferences of the Murdy's model. 
so uh, they consume and work in the first period. This is their utility from consumption. This is their disutility from labor. And they also consume in the second period. Okay? And I'm making everything uh, separable. And uh, it's something that's important to get the clean result that I, I want to get. Uh, the resource constraints, I'm going to make them very simple in this two-period model. Uh, so uh, you, there's a linear technology to uh, convert labor into goods. And there's a linear savings technology with a rate of return. Okay. Uh, so it's very much the framework of Atkinson and Stiglitz. Literally. Okay. And the aggregate resource constraints just tells you that aggregate consumption plus the amount of capital that's being invested has to be less than what's being produced. So I've normalized the wage to one. Okay. And this is the resource constraint in the second period. You can't work, you can't produce in the second period. So the only resources that uh, you can avail are uh, the, the uh, given by the capital that you invest. It's in the R. There are two periods. So you invest. You invest in period zero, and you get some return in period one, and that's the end of the world. So if you could convert part of your capital back into consumption goods, and maybe with some depreciation, that would be in the R. Okay. All right. So because everything is linear here, I can collapse the resource constraint in an intertemporal budget constraint, an intertemporal resource constraint, which just tells you that the net present value of aggregate consumption has to be less than uh, uh, what's being produced. Now, in order to introduce a trade-off between redistribution and incentives, I'm going to use this uh, familiar modeling device by now, which is to make theta private information. Okay. Uh, and for that reason, uh, allocations are going to have to be incentive compatible. Okay. Uh, and you can see that I'm writing uh, allocations directly uh, as a direct mechanism appealing to the revelation <coughs> principle. You'll see that there, are, there can be issue with the revelation principle in economies like that when I go to the dynamic setting. And I'll talk more about that then. But this is not an issue here. All right, so these are the, uh, the incentive constraints. And I'm going to be navigating between uh, characterizing allocations as a mechanism, de as the result of the mechanism design problem, and explicit implementations with nonlinear taxes. And so the kind of implementations that I'm going to be looking at are going to be enough to uh, decentralize any of the equilibrium allocations that are going to appear uh, in, my, uh, in the game are going to be very simple. So you just have a linear tax, a nonlinear tax on labor, a nonlinear tax on capital. That's right. No, no, no. I, I could propose uh, an input. I'm characterizing quite generally what the optimal location is without presuming what the tools are. And then the second step is to say, let me propose an implementation. There are many, as always. There is never an implementation. This is already an implementation. I'm just trying to propose one that gives a bit more freedom, that has a bit larger budget sets for the, for the agent. And I find it uh, attractive to have an implementation that has two separate schedules. So that's why I'm presenting this one. But there are many others. Okay? And I can, so, so you'll see, I mean, the, the, the model is going to be a policy game. And basically, I could set up the policy game directly in terms of, of mechanisms and revelations like this, or in terms of voting on a tax platform. Okay? It doesn't make uh, any difference. And I'll try to make an argument. Uh, and so if I have a decentralization like this, then uh, the agent's problem is just going to be to try to maximize his utility subject to these two budget constraints. Okay. So let me prove uh, a bit uh, a version of the taxation principle, which is that I can uh, decentralize allocations that satisfy incentive compatibility and another condition uh, with an implementation like and the idea is that if I have any, any allocation that's incentive compatible and monotone in the sense that uh, I'll make precise, then I can, I can, I can implement it uh, with nonlinear taxes on labor. 
So let me try to give you an idea about the proof. Um, so let's try to go this way. So we have an allocation that is incentive compatible and uh, monotone. So um, for a given n zero, I can lose. I can look at the at the choice uh, for c zero and uh, and c one, and uh, you can see that uh, you're going to get monotonicity here. And so it's going to be easy to implement with a with a cap beta. Now I think I've got the two directions wrong, but anyway. Uh, so this was the other way around. Sorry. Uh, it was going this way. So uh, imagine that <laughs> you have the the budget constraint. Okay. Then, uh, so the allocation is going to be incentive compatible because it's the choices of agents. And I want to prove that it's monotone. And for a given n0, I'm going to choose between, I'm going to look at the choice between c0 and c1. And just because of the way income effects are playing out here, you can see that the allocation is going to be monotone in the sense that if you have higher income, c0 uh, in particular is going to be increasing uh, in theta. Okay. So that's the other direction now. Imagine that the uh, location is incentive compatible and monotone. Let me try to construct uh, this tax scale. Then I'm going to get the marginal. I'm going to try to construct the capital tax schedule first. And I'm going to get that by uh, trying to uh, set the marginal tax rate on capital, getting it from the agent's first order condition. Okay? So I have an allocation. And uh, from the agent's first order condition, I'm going to read off uh, the marginal tax rate on capital. So I'm going to construct uh, a capital tax schedule this way. And then uh, I'm going to try to uh, construct the labor income tax uh, in a way that makes it optimal for the agents to, um, to choose uh, the allocation that they're supposed to choose. So think about uh, for a given uh, level of savings, uh, think about this allocation as indexed by y. Okay. And and uh, now you can see that uh, you have a single crossing condition between y and a here. Okay. So because you have a single crossing condition between uh, y uh, and a, and uh, and uh, because you have monotonicity, then uh, the first order conditions are sufficient for incentive compatibility, OK? And uh, so then you can just apply the construction of Merleys uh, and construct the labor income tax. So it's a version of the, of the taxation principle, all right? Bottom line, uh, I can write down any of the allocations uh, of my game are going to be incentive compatible by construction. And they're also going to be monotone in the way that's necessary for me to apply this version of the taxation principle. So I could set up my game in terms of uh, incentive compatibility constraints and direct mechanisms, or directly in terms of uh, two nonlinear tax schedules for uh, labor and cap. OK, so let me uh, go into the model a bit more now. Uh, I'm going to start with the commitment case to try to uh, uh, establish a benchmark and then understand why we deviate from that when we don't have commitment. So uh, there's going to be voting, but voting only in period zero. So we're going to vote on policies in period zero. And the way people are going to vote is according to the probabilistic voting model. Uh, so the way it works is there are two candidates. And these candidates are going to propose, for example, tax platform. So a nonlinear tax on labor, a nonlinear tax on capital. And then every agent is going to understand why, uh, what these tax schedules imply uh, for his utility. And they're going to vote for one candidate or the other, depending on whether uh, the tax policy of candidate A or the tax policy of candidate B makes them better off. OK? That's right. It's very simple. The candidates propose taxes, and I just try to figure out which one is better for me. Okay? But they're not going to vote entirely based on economics. They're going to vote also partly based on politics or ideology, which is something that I'm not going to uh, 
model, uh, as in the probabilistic voting model, so I'm going to assume that there are these shocks, okay, that are important when uh, agents compare the utility that they get from policy A versus policy B. So maybe they have a bias for uh, one political candidate versus another, okay? And uh, these shocks are gonna be IID uh, across agents, and they're gonna be uniform, okay, uh, with a large enough support. So the result, and it's a classical uh, result uh, it's, you know, of, about probabilistic voting, is that if you have these assumptions, then uh, the only equilibrium of uh, this political gain is that the two candidates propose the same policy, and it's the one that maximizes utilitarian welfare. Okay? And which one wins is decided by a flip of coin. Okay? So it, it's a model that's a bit fragile to be honest, the probabilistic voting model. So uh, in order for an equilibrium to exist, for example, then you cannot use any distribution for these shocks. Uh, but uh, we view it as a convenient modeling device. And if you don't buy into the probabilistic voting model, the thing that we really care about is uh, the end product, which is that societies for one way or another, and probabilistic voting could be one of them, end up trying to maximize utilitarian welfare in it. So you could imagine that there's a social planner, and that social planner just tries to maximize utilitarian welfare. And this social planner might have limited conditions. That would be a more straightforward uh, way to model things, though we like this interpretation to, uh, for election. Okay. And the crucial thing about this objective function is that it's going to value equality of consumption, okay, because it's utilitarian. So the commitment benchmark would just then maximize uh, utilitarian welfare subjects to incentive compatibility and resource feasibility. And then I could define, there's a solution to this uh, simple planning problem, and I could define an implicit marginal tax rate on capital from the Euler equation, just as we've done many times uh, so far. And the result, which is really due to Atkinson and Stiglitz, that's their framework, as I was emphasizing, is that in this case, you get zero taxes on capital. Okay? It's actually more general in the sense that you could put any kind of Pareto weights here uh, and you would find uh, zero taxes on capital. So any constrained Pareto efficient allocation would have zero capital taxation under commitment. Okay? And it's something that relies on set value. Now, let's try to introduce uh, this idea about limited commitment. And the way it's going to happen in the model is that there are going to be elections not only in period zero, but also in period one. So, you, so if you want to uh, stick to mechanism territory, then one thing you could say is each party is going to propose a direct mechanism, and agents are going to vote on which mechanism they want to live with. Another way, which I prefer, is to say each party is going to propose a tax policy, a nonlinear tax on labor, a nonlinear tax on capital. And then people are going to compute their utility according to these taxes, add their uh, noise disturbance, and decide which candidate to vote for. And then they're going to have to live with the taxes of the platform that wins. Okay. So, so now. Uh, Imagine that there's voting uh, in each period, not only in period zero, but also in period one. So in period zero, we, see, we saw that uh, uh, we're going to choose a tax system that somehow maximizes utilitarian welfare subject to some constraints. And I'll come back to that. But then in period one, there's going to be a new election. Okay? And the new election is going to be uh, decided exactly in the same way. And the outcome is going to be maximizing utilitarian welfare seen from period one. And it's a welfare function that's not going to take into account period zero anymore because uh, these things are in the past. Now, if I didn't put anything else here, what you would see is that there would be a perfect equalization of consumption uh, in the second period. So there would be no incentive to save. 
so you would see the wealth levy, and the wealth levy wouldn't levy anything because people wouldn't. That's the Fisher, the version of the Fisher solution. Uh, and it's interesting, but I want to study something a bit different. I want to introduce a constitution. Okay? And the way I'm going to model the constitution is as follows. Yes, you can reform the tax system that was voted uh, in the first period, but it's costly. Okay? Maybe it's the cost of changing the constitution. Or maybe because you cause some kind of social unrest when you change the rules, or I don't know exactly what it is. And, and the way I'm going to model it is, is an output cost that's going to be lost if you implement uh, a reform. So the benefit, if you reform the tax system in period one, seen from period one, is that you manage to achieve a greater value for utilitarian welfare. You manage to achieve a more equal outcome. Okay. Actually, it's completely egalitarian. You equalize everybody's consumption. But on the other hand, you lose some output. Okay? So you're going to trade off these two things and decide uh, whether you're going to vote for a platform that indeed uh, expropriates wealth. Okay? And this would be the level of uh, everybody's consumption depending on the capitalist tax. So basically, uh, the platform that's going to be implemented in period one is going to depend on the comparison between utilitarian welfare according to the proposed policy in the first period, and utilitarian welfare uh, if we deviate, implement a wealth levy, wipe the slates clean, everybody, uh, equalize everybody's consumption, but pay the resource cost bill. Okay. Uh, so let me flesh it out a bit. In T equals zero, the two candidates uh, propose taxes, the agents votes, a winner is picked, uh, that becomes law. Then the agents make their labor and savings decisions, in period one, you inherit this distribution of savings, and at t equals one, the candidates are going to propose platforms either <coughs> that stick to the original one or a platform that uh, implements a wealth levy. Okay. Now, uh, what you can see is that, uh, once again, the reform is going to happen uh, if this equality, inequality is violated. And uh, so the capital taxes that are implemented in the first period and the asset accumulation decisions uh, made by the agents are going to determine whether there's a reform or not. But you can see that at date zero, candidates are never going to propose a platform that's going to lead to a reform. Why? Because they could uh, get exactly the same outcome without paying the uh, reform cost. In other words, if they think that, if they propose a platform that leads to a reform, then they could just as well propose an alternative platform that expropriates wealth in period one and avoids uh, the reform cost. They would put it in the Constitution in period zero. Well, they just want to win. They want to win the election. There are a lot of other motives you might want to consider, like maybe you know, they want to enrich themselves or, or, or maybe, you know, they're agents of a particular party in the population and they want to give them, you know, goodies. And so here they, they, they want to win. So here I'm imagining that these are different candidates. Uh, so they, they, are not, they don't really try to uh, stay in power. Uh, it, it's not going to make much of a difference. This is a good question. Okay? So that's it. Okay? Now we're led to, we've understood the policy game and we've boiled down the, the equilibrium to a simple mathematical problem. Uh, we know what the uh, parties are going to propose in period zero. They're going to try to maximize utilitarian welfare, subjects to incentive compatibility and resource feasibility, just as when they had commitment, just as in the Atkinson Stiglitz problem, but with an additional constraint that they want to avoid a reform. So I'm going to call this a credibility constraint. The taxes that they propose have to be credible in the sense that people are not going to want to overturn them. Okay? So any result that I get about capital taxation is going to be coming from this constraint. Because without this constraint, we've established, re-established the Atkinson Stiglitz result that capital taxes are equal to zero. Okay? So it's a, it really uh, is a simple planning problem, and you can characterize the allocation by just taking first order condition. It's, it's 
The only point I want to make is that it's not hard. Okay? It's, a, it's an elementary step. And you're going to get non-zero capital taxes from there. And you're going to be able to say more. So these are two formulas that you can get by manipulating those first order conditions and that give you the results that we want. So one of them is very useful uh, to see the progressivity. So this is the tax rate on capital for type theta. Okay? And uh, so the denominator is something that's positive okay? so, uh, and constant uh, across all theta types. So not something that uh, we want to worry about now. And the numerator compares uh, the marginal utility that uh, agent gets in period one if there is a reform to the marginal utility that they get in, the, in period zero under uh, the actual plan. Okay. The only thing that depends on theta in this formula is this term here. Okay. So uh, C0 is increasing in theta. More productive people consume more. U prime is decreasing in C0. So U prime is decreasing in theta, and there's a minus, so it's increasing in theta. Okay? So you get progressive capital taxes. I'll give you an intuition uh, in a minute. Now onto the level, it's uh, useful for that to uh, rewrite uh, the formula a little bit, and you can trust me that uh, I can get this formula for capital taxes. And this formula compares now the marginal utility that agent get if there is a reform to the marginal utility in period one that they get if there is no reform. Okay. Now, you know that the integral of C1 is equal to RK1. Okay. So at least the top guy has to have a C1 that's higher than RK1 minus rho because it's higher than RK1. So he has to have a positive marginal tax rate. Okay. And uh, similarly, you can show that the bottom guy is going to get a negative. So that's our result. You get uh, progressive capital taxes, positive at the top, negative at the bottom. Okay. Now, obviously, this assumes that uh, the credibility constraint is binding. So as Eric was suggesting, if I make this row high enough, then this constraint is not going to be binding. So if people have so much respect for constitutions that they never rewrite them, okay then it's not a problem and we're going to live in a world of zero capital taxes. Okay. So for it to matter, the commitment problems have to be severe enough or the constitutional kind of solutions to the commitment problems have to be not effective enough that this remains a problem. Okay? That's right. Uh, you, you could imagine that small reforms are, are less costly. That's than right. Big reforms. Right. Uh, so the reason, so I think it's it's completely uh, fair, and you could so, so the way to think about it is this cost rho could depend on the distance between the taxes that you propose and the taxes that have been voted in period zero. That would be very reasonable, and that would lead to uh, a, a different kind. Of, of credibility concerns. Okay. And, and but that, that's not going to interfere with your progressivity. No, well, that would still be there, yeah. but it would affect the, the solution. The dynamic model that I'm going to write next uh, is going to have a bit that flavor of the discreteness uh, because it's going to rely on trigger strategies. Uh, now, people have mixed feelings about trigger strategies, so depending on how you personally feel about them, you, you like uh, this rationalization or not. But that, that's the way we're going to go about it uh, in, in the model. Okay. So even a small deviation uh, could uh, trigger radically different expectations. And actually, that helps you implement good outcomes, of course. Now the question is whether it's reasonable uh, to assume something like that. Okay. So uh, the distortions are really coming from uh, this credibility constraint. And just mathematically, so you understand, the left-hand side is the thing that's going to give you a progressive subsidy. And the right-hand side is, going is the thing that's going to give you a constant tax. If you combine the two, uh, you get a progressive tax that's positive at the top and negative at the bottom. So how does it work? 
If you have progressivity, basically what's, let me put it differently. You need to provide some incentives uh, in period zero. Okay. And there are Kins and Stiglitz, the way you provide these incentives, so this is period zero, and this is period one, is by, uh, this is theta, and this is uh, theta prime, and this is theta. Theta prime is higher than theta. The way you provide incentive in Atkinson and Stiglitz when there's full commitment is by promise, by, by giving uh, agents who uh, declare to be of a higher type a higher consumption profile in a parallel way. Why? Because you want to respect consumption smoothing. They want to smooth consumption all the time. Okay? So you spread out consumption because you have to give incentives. You want to make the productive people work more. And the way you spread out consumption is completely parallel. This is assuming uh, beta r is equal to 1. Otherwise, you get uh, uh, lines that are not uh, parallel like this, but they would be uh, parallel like this. OK? Now, what we're going to do here is something different. We're going to do something like that, basically. OK? So we still have to provide incentives, OK? But we're going to try to front load those incentives. OK? So in order to give incentives, we have to tolerate consumption inequality because of the prior information. Uh, that's the nature of this trade-off. But we're going to try to shift some of this consumption inequality to the first period. Why? Because then I have less consumption inequality in the second period. And as you can see, if there's less consumption inequality in the second period, then this reduces the temptation uh, to do a reform. So you gain on credibility. So that's really the, uh, what's behind this result. So you see that it's really uh, ex ante kind of considerations that are driving this. Okay? You want to propose a system that's progressive uh, to make sure that the society doesn't become so unequal that bad outcomes happen, like revolutions or rewriting of constitutions or things like that. Okay? Any questions, or it's clear? Okay. All right. If we go to the implementation, okay, then uh, we can say something very precise about the tax schedule for capital. Okay, it's just a convex uh, tax schedule, and you know that it's going to be increasing at the top because the tax rates are positive there. And it might be decreasing at the bottom because uh, it will be decreasing at the bottom because tax rates are low. Okay, so. Uh, you've understood by now that it's kind of hard to characterize the shapes of uh, optimal tax schedules in general. In particular, for the labor income tax, it depends a lot on your welfare function. It depends a lot uh, on the kind of distributions that you put in there. It's very hard to get progressivity. You know, Murdy's first wrote his model, and he didn't get progressivity. And here you have to, uh, if you worked a bit in this literature, you appreciate that you get something a bit clean. Here, just period one. Uh, but I'm stripping it down just because I want to have the essential ingredients to convey the intuition. In the model I'm about to present now, uh, they're going to work in every period. Okay. So I have to say that, uh, so now I'm going to move to the, to the dynamic model. And we wrote several uh, versions of this model. And in the paper that we just published, actually, which is a, a different version, uh, we worked with an OLG model. So you have different generations uh, that overlap. Uh, and the reason we did that is because we wanted to separate a bit this argument that, as you can see, has nothing to do with the inverse Euler equation or anything like that uh, from inverse Euler considerations that are going to show up in the version I'm going to present today. Because I'm going to assume that uh, agents are infinitely live and there's this incentive problem in every period. Okay, so we're still going to be able to somehow separate them but in the, the version that we published, we uh, took them apart completely uh, using a slightly different way. OK? So, all right. So let me move to the infinite horizon model. And uh, so that's going to become a, a dynamic game. I'm going to assume away this uh, exogenous cost of reform. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to try to derive it uh, from from my model. And um, 
and agents are going to consume and work uh, in every case. So there are, are going to be two differences. Uh, the first one is this idea about trigger strategy or reputational equilibria, which is going to lead to an endogenization of these row functions. And uh, I'm not going to present it today, but we have some, we tried to do some numerical applications uh, of this model. And as you can imagine, one thing is very hard to calibrate is this row parameter because you really have no idea what it is. And so the dynamic model allows you to have uh, some discipline uh, in the way uh, you think uh, about this parameter. Uh, so here, uh, we're going to just a preview also. Uh, as you probably know, in these dynamic games, uh, there are a lot of equilibrium. And so we have to do some selection. And the selection that seemed the most appropriate is to look at the best equilibrium from uh, the point of view of uh, date zero welfare. And that's enforced by uh, triggering very bad expectation, triggering the worst equilibrium if there is any kind of deviation. And it's not clear that this worst equilibrium is very reasonable. But you can still try to see what happens when uh, what you trigger is something a bit better than the worst equilibrium. Uh, it gives you a way of thinking about this role that's a bit more interpretable, uh, I think. Uh, so I think that's an advantage. The other thing that's, uh, that's interesting is that we can really think about uh, the dynamic and the long-run evolution of, uh, of inequality. And in the Malby's commitment, this is something I've talked about in, uh, in my first lecture, you would have this peculiar result, which is called immiseration, okay? which is that over time, uh, because uh, consumption is basically a random walk, uh, you can use the Martingale convergence theorem to see that you're going to have, uh, that it's going to converge. And actually, it's going to converge to zero, almost surely. So what's going to happen is that everybody's going to be driven to absolute misery, and all the resources in the economy are going to be concentrated in the vanishing fraction of the population, the lucky ones. Okay. And you can see right away that this distribution is going to be horrible at some point, eventually. Okay? It's a distribution where most people are exactly at zero, and you have a few people who concentrate all the resources. They are the 1%. <laughs> okay? And, and uh, from the point of view, uh, so, so it's going to be very tempting at the, when you reach something like that to try to deviate and propose something different. Okay? Uh, so it won't be, it just can't be an equilibrium that uh, the credibility constraints are not binding. Okay? Because you would reach this terrible outcome where eventually you're sure that they're binding. So you don't know if they're going to be binding all the time, but they have to be occasionally binding. And actually, you'll see that, I mean, I, I won't prove it today, but what happens, at least uh, in, our, in our simulations, is that uh, you converge to a steady state with an invariant distribution okay. uh, when you put in uh, those columns. All right. So these are uh, the preferences, and they're, they just generalize the preferences that I lay down for uh, the two-period model. So people consume and work uh, in every period. And I'm allowing for a, uh, uh, a non-degenerate distribution of uh, initial utility entitlement. So some people have been promised more utility than others. You have the wealthy and the less wealthy. And psi is the distribution of these utility entitlements. The resource constraints is going to be more general than what I had also, and it's just going to be a neoclassical production function. And to preempt your question, the depreciation is incorporated in the, in, in the production function. In the end. So uh, that's going to be a game. And as I was saying, it's a, it's a complicated game. You have uh, the politicians in every period, and you have all the agents in the economy. And I really, uh, I was trying, as I was trying to explain, I really want to focus uh, the, the attention on the, the strategic interactions between the politicians and not so much of the private agents. I'd like to make them as competitive as possible. And there's this equilibrium uh, concept that was proposed by Charing Kehoe uh, called the sustainable plan. And basically, it's a symmetric, perfect Bayesian equilibrium of an anonymous game. So it's a restriction on, on the strategies. Okay? Uh, so there's going to be, in every period, a public history uh, and this public history is going to be the past policies. So I'm going to just, I should have said that. I'm going to set up the game in terms of uh, the mechanisms directly here. 
Okay? And these past policies involve uh, the, uh, the mapping from uh, types to consumption and uh, the investment uh, decision, the aggregate investment decision. And then there are going to be some individual uh, histories. But let me not go into detail uh, about this, but they, they play a role in the construction of uh, the equilibrium and the different stages within a period. So how does it work? Within a period, first, the individual shocks are realized. Okay? Then uh, agents are going to uh, be sending messages. Okay? And at this, I'm not doing the revelation principle here because I, I'm not guaranteed that it uh, holds. Okay, and the reason for that is that when you have persistent types and you have limited commitment, you might not, I mean, it might not be optimal to reveal uh, all the information that's out there. Okay? Uh, and so I'll talk about the kind of complications that uh, arise from that. So they send a message and they work. And then output is produced. That's the first stage. Then uh, candidates show up. And they see uh, the, the joint distribution of, uh, of utilities and these histories here. Okay, so the past, uh, the past reports, the past uh, consumption, the past labor, and the current reports and work they see. Okay, and they're going to propose a platform that uh, does the two following thing. It tells you, as a function of this H hat, how much you're supposed to consume. And you can see that it's not tailored to a given individual. So two individuals who've had the same history are going to be treated the same. Okay, that's the anonymity thing. And they propose also uh, an investment decision, and it has to be reported uh, feasible. Okay. Uh, and um, so then agents are going to vote on these two platforms, depending on which one gives them the, the highest utility, and the, the winning platform is going to be implemented, and then we move, we move to the next period. And the sustainable equilibrium is just going to say that all agents uh, optimize uh, given their history. Okay? So you see that there's a, a timing assumption here that is not the same as in the two-period model. Agents produce first and vote then. Uh, it's not completely innocuous. Uh, it makes the model uh, a lot more uh, tractable uh, for us. Uh, we, can, I can, we can talk a bit about what happens if I make a more symmetric uh, timing assumption. So first, I want to uh, avoid those issues about uh, the relation principle not holding, uh, and then I'll return to it. Uh, so if the shocks are IID, then there's really no concern, because the information that you revealed today is not helpful at all to uh, anticipate what kind of shocks you face in the future. Okay, so the relation principle uh, is going to hold there. And uh, so we can study direct mechanism. So I have this notation uh, to denote the utility that you get from a given allocation and there are given reporting strategies. And incentive compatibility just says that truth telling has to be better than uh, anything else. Okay. Then an allocation is going to be feasible if uh, when I define the aggregate labor and the aggregate consumption this way, uh, the allocation satisfies incentive compatibility, resource feasibility, and delivers uh, the right uh, utility uh, to every agent. Okay. Now, uh, let's try to think about uh, credibility. So as I said, this is a, a game. And as with, uh, is often the case with dynamic games, there are a lot of equilibria. So we're going to try to uh, study the best equilibrium. And uh, the best equilibrium is going to be sustained by if there's a deviation at any point, if the candidate proposes something that he wasn't supposed to propose at the, uh, at the best equilibrium, then it's going to trigger very bad expectation. And actually, it's going to trigger the worst equilibrium. Okay, So it's a very powerful kind of deviation. And the idea is that. Imagine that the candidates deviate by uh, saying, I'm going to do wealth levy. Then people start thinking that this thing is going to be repeated. You know, uh, it happened once, it's going to happen again. And, and sometimes that would be enough to sustain the worst equilibrium. Sometimes you need more than that. So the credible, uh, a credible allocation is going to be feasible and satisfy those credibility constraints, which is that at any point in time, 
utilitarian welfare, okay, the continuation utilitarian welfare, has to be greater than this payoff here. And this payoff here is uh, what happens if, uh, so you deviate, okay, and you propose a policy that equalizes everybody's consumption today. And from tomorrow on, uh, it's the worst equilibrium. Okay. So you see that there's a gain from this deviation, which is that you can equalize everybody's consumption, but there's also a cost that comes in the future because you trigger a bad equilibrium. So you have the same kind of benefit and cost from deviating that were present uh, in the two periods model. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going there. It turns out that for our results, we don't need to uh, fully characterize uh, the worst equilibrium. Uh, but we need to know a few things about it. Uh, we need to know that uh, it's well behaved in K, that it's increasing and concave. And once we know that, we can have uh, our results. But I'll show you a little more, actually. So what's the worst? Uh, so the worst is uh, the solution of a min-max problem. It's not always the case, but you can show that it's the case in this problem, okay? Where uh, you max over investment and, and uh, you minimize uh, over labor, okay? And you can just see from this problem that uh, you're going to have two implications. Uh, that the worst is going to be non-decreasing and concave, and that this payoff W hat is going to be increasing concave and differentiable. That's all we care about. At the worst, and this is going to be important when we uh, deviate from the relation principle, well, from the idea assumption, people could either work, it's bang, bang. They could either work a lot or work zero. Okay, So it either looks like something where uh, you don't work at all okay, or something where it's a living hell and you work a lot. Okay. And the solution where you don't work at all is going to be attractive for me when I go to, um, to the case where shocks are persistent because uh, it's a case where you wouldn't, be, you, you wouldn't be able to make any use of the prior information that agents have revealed because there has to work zero. Okay. So that's the case that we're going to be able to, to see. So the best equilibrium is a solution of a, a simple uh, planning problem, which is to minimize the initial capital stock subject to uh, the allocation being uh, credible. So feasible and satisfying the credibility constraint. And uh, this multiplier here, nu, is going to be crucial. It's, uh, it's positive if, only if, if and only if the credibility constraint is binding. And you can see that what replaces the u prime of R rk1 minus rho is the derivative of uh, this function here. You can also see how uh, you would solely be able to uh, derive similar first order conditions if uh, you think that the worst is too drastic and instead you wanted to uh, sustain a good outcome with uh, a less bad outcome. Okay. So you can uh, rework uh, these conditions and, uh, and find uh, something like this. So uh, let me try to derive uh, my results now. <coughs> so there's an issue uh, for the tax on capital because uh, in order to uh, implement simply uh, the equilibrium allocation of the best equilibrium, I need to have a tax on capital that depends on the report in the next period. Okay, so these tell how to depend on theta. But I can define an average capital tax that can be faced by agents in every period. Okay. And this average capital tax is going to inherit all the desirable properties of uh, the capital tax in the two periods. So uh, you see that these formulas are very similar to the ones uh, I had in the two-period model, and they're going to deliver exactly the same result. Ex post? No, it's progressive in V. Let me be precise. Okay, each agent has a productivity process. Okay, and uh, it also has at every point in time a promised utility the equivalent of his wealth, really. Okay. So the average capital tax is going to be progressive in wealth. But uh, the dependence on the capital tax on theta, his shock tomorrow, is typically not progressive. 
it's typically in this implementation is regressive actually. Okay, so that's because we're mixing uh, the considerations of the two-period model that I'm really interested in with these considerations that have to do with the inverse Euler equation that I'm less interested in in this particular paper. That's why we wrote a different version of the model uh, in the version that we eventually published. But here, the two come together. Okay. And the progressivity is on uh, the, w the wealth that you've accumulated or the continuation you've done. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just say the way you would uh, implement it. Uh, so this is an implementation that was proposed by Narayana Koshalakota in an econometrica paper. So um, the capital tax uh, is going to be defined uh, from the first order conditions of agents. Okay. So you have these tally. And then uh, we're going to define the labor income tax from these budget constraints. Okay. Where we're going to specify the amount of savings that we want agents to do. So the savings could be done by the agents or by the government. There's a uh, recurrent equivalence. And uh, so that's an implementation that works. And the reason it works is because it takes care of joint deviations, where you jointly uh, save and expect to lie tomorrow. Why? Because the Euler equation holds no matter what your reporting strategy tomorrow is. OK. So uh, that's the key. And, uh, and what you find is that uh, the tax is defined this way. And uh, the average tax on capital is given by this formula. Okay. And you get progressivity because this function here, which is the only part of this formula that depends on VT, uh, is going to be increasing in VT. So you get progressivity uh, in, in continuation VT. Okay. Uh, we have an alternative implementation that tries to separate these two concerns also. So you have a part that looks a bit like uh, Koshalakota, but that averages to zero. And then we have a nonlinear capital tax that takes care of, of our concerns. Okay, but l let me not be presenting here because uh, I don't have much time. So let me move to the case there where, uh, in principle, the relation principle doesn't hold because shocks are not IIG. So again, the, the concern that you have here is that uh, the government doesn't have commitment. So uh, by revealing information today, uh, you might, uh, if the government deviates tomorrow, it might exploit this information uh, in a way uh, that is undesirable. So we have two approaches. One approach is to have additional assumptions that guarantee that even though the shocks are persistent, we can still apply the relation principle. And uh, then we treat the case where uh, really it's a problem. Uh, we don't make those assumptions. The relation principle fails. Maybe not all the information is revealed in equilibrium, so you have some partial pooling. Uh, and, uh, and we derive a version of our result, an average kind of progressivity. So let me uh, talk about the first one, uh, if the shocks are non-IID. Uh, so basically, these are assumptions. Let me not go into details about them. But they guarantee that uh, labor is productive enough and that marginal utility uh, is high enough, it's not decreasing too fast. Then those assumptions guarantee that the worst equilibrium is going to make uh, agent work zero. Why? Because if you made them work more in an uh, effort to try to lower utility, to, try to have an even worse equilibrium, because they're quite productive and because marginal utility doesn't decrease very fast, you would end up improving uh, average. So the worst is going to be something where you ask them to work zero. Okay, because you ask them to work zero, then any information that they might have revealed in equilibrium is not going to be useful of equilibrium. Okay, so we can be sure uh, that uh, that the revelation principle is going to hold again. You're going to reveal everything, and exactly the same analysis uh, is going to apply. Okay, but. You know, these assumptions, I have no idea if they're uh, reasonable or not. So let's try to understand what would happen if, uh, if we didn't make those assumptions. And so in that case, it might be the case that you don't want uh, agents to uh, perfectly separate, to perfectly reveal all their information in equal. 
So then we have to uh, treat, uh, we cannot use uh, direct mechanism, we have to treat general mechanism. Uh, and we can still, uh, so there's going to be a, a mechanism with some messages. And I can still define uh, an implicit capital tax rate. And I can still define an average capital tax rate for agents, which is after a given history of reports, the average uh, capital tax rate that they're going to be facing uh, depending on their reported model. But note that this is potentially different from the average capital tax rate that's perceived by agent. This is the average capital tax rate in the sense that's perceived by the principal, but he has less information than the agent. The agent might know more. Okay? Maybe some types uh, with different histories okay, have uh, the same history of reports. Okay? So they understand that they're going to have different histories from each other of reports tomorrow, which is not something the principal uh, can tease out. Okay? So I can tell you that uh, the implementation is still going to work, and we're going to have a result on the progressivity of this function. Okay? So it's progressive in whatever is observable. You can't make it in progress progressive in something that's not observed uh, in equilibrium. Okay? But it's a bit of a weaker result because, once again, this thing doesn't correspond to the taxes that agents are perceiving themselves. Okay. So let me wrap up here. Uh, that was uh, the paper I wanted to, to present today. And the main idea was that uh, some uh, political economy constraints that combine a desire for redistribution and no commitment can lead to uh, positive and progressive capital taxes. And the key idea is that uh, progressivity helps credibility. And, uh, and it obviously raises a lot of uh, potential extensions that would be interesting, uh, looking at, uh, at other policies and characterizing other policies uh, and how they would be affected by credibility and trying to think uh, about different forms of capital also. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.